In 1921, after the Armenian Genocide was carried out by the Turkish Army, Armenia's economic power was tragically stripped away by the Soviet Socialist Republic, who incentivized giving up their land in return for protection against the Turkish Army. Although the Armenians tragically lost independence and were forced to adhere to Soviet Communist rule, in 1991, the fall of the Soviet Union inspired the Armenian people to triumphantly rebuild their economy as a newly independent nation, which in turn shaped the evolving economy of the Second Republic of Armenia today. During the years of 1921 to 1991, the Armenian economy experienced both tragedy and triumph during and after Soviet Union imperialism. In 1920, just before the Soviet Socialist Republic's Red Army invaded Armenia, Armenia itself suffered from an attempted genocide and ethnic cleansing of their homeland by the Turks. This was in response to the fear that Armenia would join forces with Russia. The attempted invasion was destructive to the Armenian economy, leaving it almost non-functioning. People's businesses, homes, churches, and entire cities were destroyed by the Turkish army, and they didn't have enough money to rebuild. This was Armenia's first tragedy that sparked the astronomical shift in Armenia's economy. In exchange for protection, free health care, and access to food and shelter, with a promise for a revived economy, Armenians agreed to peacefully give up their independence as the First Republic of Armenia to the authority of the newly developing Soviet Socialist Republic. During the more primitive stages of the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic, or the ASSR, The Armenian people, along with other SSRs, lost most of their economic freedom due to a new communist state established by the Russians. People lost their businesses and were put to work in the factories newly built by the Russians. As time progressed, Armenia became much more technologically advanced and developed on an economical standpoint. As an example, there is a man named Arsen Mikoyan, who was a scientist who developed the MiG fighter planes for the Russians. The MiG fighter plane was an important asset to the USSR's Air Force. Now Joseph Dadigyan, who studied the history of Soviet Armenia, mentions how Armenia was the country with the highest ranking intelligence within the Soviet Union. He mentions that most of the Armenians during this time were highly educated, usually with PhDs in nuclear physics. These intellectuals with these degrees were some of Russia's best resources for technological and industrial innovation, more so nuclear power plant construction. Essentially, the smart people from this tiny country contributed greatly to build a thriving economy for the USSR. So during the beginning and transition period of the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic, the situation was economically was not great, but was growing and improving at a much more accelerated pace than expected. To gain first-hand knowledge of life in the ASSR, An interview was conducted with Dikran and Narine Dolokhanyan. These ASSR natives were born and raised on Soviet Armenian soil. As residents of the country for over 40 years, they shared their perspective on life in the ASSR and changes they witnessed over time. They say how the 1960s was the best time for Soviet Armenia's economy. They explain that everyone was happy and no one had any fears of economy crash. Everything was extremely cheap, they both said. Dikran mentions on how trade with other Soviet countries was essential to Armenia's economy in order to make it function. He said even though Armenians had their own car company, half of the material to make the car was imported by Georgia, Latvia, and Ukraine. Narine talked about how the gas prices were at an all-time low and was very easy to obtain from Russia. But at the same time, they said it was too cheap along with everything else. Every newspaper was only one kopeck, which at the time is only worth one penny in the in U.S. dollars. So essentially, the state-owned businesses were not getting nearly enough profits to withstand spending. Around 1973, they said, the economy started taking a slow and steady downfall. In 1998, a 6.8 magnitude earthquake hit the region of Armenia, devastating the whole country. This caused factories to be destroyed along with houses, power lines, and gas pipes. This meant the means of productions have ceased and people are out of work 
State relief crews did not have enough money to help rebuild and recover ravaged Armenia from the earthquake, and foreign relief efforts such as the Red Cross were unable to help due to the strict border control laws the Soviets had. As the months went on, people were starving, cold, and lived in the dark due to the lack of power and gas. Following that, not even three years later, in 1991, the Soviet Union came to an abrupt crash leaving Armenia and other SSRs completely independent. Now this was Armenia's first triumph because they now have their independent country again, but also their tragedy because they are no longer under the economic safety blanket they once were with Russia. That year also marked the greatest tragedy in the Russian Federation because they have lost one of the most powerful empires in the world history. For Armenia, around 1992, the fall of the Soviet Union left Armenia to fend for itself. At this point, there is no functioning economy. It was a 100% free market, hyper-capitalist enterprise. This meant no regulation whatsoever on whose business, how the product is made or sold. Gas stations didn't work, so people would stand in the streets with tanks of gasoline and were overcharged passing cars really hard to obtain gas. At the same time, houses and apartments were still freezing cold because of the lack of electricity and gas. Tarin Dorukhanyan mentions that every single night when she'd come home from him and was trying to find a place to work, she would remove her car battery and walk it up the stairs to the apartment. She would then attach it to a light bulb so her son could study and finish his homework. Other residents of Armenia would even go outside and cut down entire forests just in order to keep a little warmer for the winter times. Now around 1996, a primitive economy was forming within Armenia. The Armenians were determined to get back up on their feet. But since there was still no economical regulations, these small businesses would grow without any competition with other companies. These monopolies were usually corrupt and would raise the prices of their products for no reason. An example of a monopoly at the time was Noi Bottled Water. Noi Bottled Water was becoming too expensive at the time but was the only bottled water brand. At the same time, Armenia's newly developed democratic parliament was trying to make money for the country by making citizenship cost $1,000 USD and 400,000 dram AMD. This was becoming surprisingly effective because so many Armenians who once left Armenia wanted to come back to the motherland. As of present day, it only cost $2 USD and 400,000 dram AMD to apply for citizenship in Armenia due to a more stabilized economy. In the year 2000, most of the once less green forests have been banished into barren open fields. A group of Armenian Americans decided to invest in a non profit organization called the Armenian Tree Project. The Armenian Tree Project's main intent was to replant all of the cut down trees in Armenia to replenish the forests. Armenia Tree Project shows the hardship and tragedy of post-Soviet Armenia due to the desperate and poor economy. It shows that people are motivated and hardworking in order to get their country back up on their feet. Now, even though Armenia has been rebuilding itself from the fall of the Soviet Union, corruption within the government and economy has been a struggle. The Armenian's former Prime Minister, Serge Sarkisian, 2008-2018, had ties to the Mafia and other organized crime within Armenia and Europe. The people knew uh, that he was a selfish man when it came to money. He would hold back funds for the military and foreign aid all for himself, and when the people realized what he had been doing, he was forced to step down by millions of peaceful student activists against economical corruption within the Armenian government. As of May 2018, when he stepped down, a new prime minister known as Nikol Pashinyan was democratically elected by the people of Armenia as he promised to fight corruption within the government and correct the unregulated economy. 
So I think it is fair to say that Armenia has experienced both tragedy and triumph in a matter of almost a century with its economy. Even though the fall of the Soviet Union made it extremely difficult to rebuild Armenia's economy, the Armenian population and diaspora have and will continue to put in efforts to eliminate monopolies and economic corruption within Armenia that the USSR brought upon them.